Welcome to Advanced Reverse Engineering. This homework, and the homework is to do live variable analysis. And so we're going to start with a set of variables at the end that we'll assume to be live, and you'll work backward computing the live variable set prior to each line. So the set we're going to start with is a set R12, R13, R14, R15, RBX, RSP, and RBP. And you should recognize though, you should say, ah, those are the registers that I am supposed to preserve across function calls. Those are the ones. In addition, RAX is in that list because that's your return value. So you can think of those as sort of the outer context in which the program runs. What about RDI and RSI and the others? We'll see those in just a few minutes. So I'm going to give you a block out of a executable ELF file, and that block is going to end with a return. And I won't give you one that involves any complicated control flow. And if there are calls or syscalls in it, just ignore them. So for example, uh, for the code at right, we have the set of variables that are live immediately prior to this return. We go up one and we are popping RBX. So think what that does. That's going to write to RBX. So prior to this line, RBX is no longer live because it's written to. What are the R values? What are the what does it read in order to do that? Well, it's going to modify the stack pointer but it's also going to read the stack pointer, right? It's going, to, it's going to change its value by a fixed amount. So the stack pointer is both an L value and an R value. So the stack pointer uh, can enter and be live at that point. And we work our way back just like that. The two rules you need to apply, basically in order, are if a register is an L value, remove it from the live set. And if it's an R value, add it to the live set. And if you do them in that order, you should be pretty good. You'll want to convert the, you want to, you'll want to know what registers are read and which ones are, are written. And you'll want to convert them to normalized register names. And, and there's some code that does that. To get the registers that are read, R values, and written, the L values, for an instruction, use regs access. So inst is an instruction instance and that's what comes back from the disasm. And I invoke the regs access method on it and that hands back a pair consisting of read nums and write nums. These are arrays of numbers so each register is identified by a number. But I want names so I'm going to use two Python list comprehensions to make that change. Let's pick on the bottom one. So for reg in write nums, so for each number that's in there, I'm going to compute a new result for a new array. And that new result will be to go to the instruction and invoke the reg name method, give it that number, and that will hand back to me a string that is the name of that register. It might be something like AX or EAX or RAX, but, but those are all the same register. So what I will do is I'll wrap this in norm reg to normalize it so then I just see RAX. We'll see norm reg in just a moment. I'm going to provide that for you. Once I'm done with that, I should have two arrays of strings identifying the names of the registers that are read and written. And that's what I want going forward. Note that you'll get XMM registers this way. You may also get R flags in here. Uh, you won't get the individual flags like ZF and CF, but you'll just be notified that the flags register is, is implicated. So here's what that would look like. This is what your output should look like. It should look something like this. Uh, addresses followed by the set of registers that are live at that address. At the end of all this, I want you to compute two differences. Take the set of registers that are alive at the start and subtract the ones that are alive at the end. And then I want you to take the ones that are alive at the end and subtract the ones that are alive at the start. This should just be a, this is sort of a poor man's way of saying what are inputs and what are outputs. 
It's not perfect, of course. Um, Rx could be live at the start and live at the end, in which case it would get subtracted out of both sets, and that's not what we want. But it will, it'll, it'll give you a sense of what's going on. We can find better ways to do it uh, later on. All right. Here's an example of doing the analysis. Here, there's a little piece of code in blue, and you can see the live register set prior to each line. And you can see when a register is being removed or added to that set. For calls and syscalls, ignore them. Some hints, uh, you're probably gonna want to use, a, use uh, sets and maps. And you can see examples of that over on the right hand side. You can sort a set with sorted and you'll see that at the top. Uh, and you'll see how maps work there as well. And, and I want to caution you that if you're storing a set or a map in another data structure, you should first copy it, make a copy of it. Uh, if you don't do that, then they're all sort of linked, but not exactly, and the results can be very unpredictable and not what you want at all. So use copy whenever you store one of these in another data structure. Copy's pretty cheap. It's a shallow copy. Uh, here is normreg. Normreg basically just, you know, if you give it a register name like uh, R9D, or sorry, R9B, it's going to give you back R9. So it's going to normalize the register names for you. And there we go. So let's get back to Steensguard's algorithm. Remember this, that uh, Steensguard is trying to solve the points to problem. He's wanting to do it fast. So almost linear time means not quite linear time, but we're really close to linear time. It's flow insensitive, so we don't have to worry about control structures in, in the code. It's interprocedural, so it's a whole program analysis kind of tool. It works, you know, interprocedural, right? Between procedures. Uh, points to analysis is what we're solving. It's done in linear space, which is good, and it's done in almost linear time, but it's also very fast in practice, right? You could be linear but have a giant multiplier in front of that linear. So maybe it takes you know, 10 years to do one, 100 years to do two, 190 years to do three, right? That's linear, but not good. Recall his notation. So he uh, defined a type lattice and we have that little symbol in the bracketed red there is the bottom of that type of lattice. Think of it as bottom, or you can think of it as unspecified, or you can think of it as primitive, a primitive uh, type, however you'd like to think about it. Basically, it's where the recursion ends. It's where our type recursion stops. Um, and, and that's what that represents. So we can have a type of a thing in memory. So the tau could be a bottom, stopping the recursion, or it could be a reference to some alpha. And alpha's up at the top. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Likewise, we can have a type for a function. Uh, the function could be, again, bottom, or it could be a lambda that takes a set of arguments and returns a sequence of, respond of, uh, of uh, results. We can have you know, multiple returns here. Or alpha. So you'll notice that these are all Recursive. Every time you see an alpha there, it's referring to an instance of that alpha at the top, where it's a combination of it's a cross product of both tau and lambda. And, and of course, you're not going to have both. You're going to either be a thing in memory or you're going to be a function, uh, but not both. And so it's, you can think of that as a union of the two. So you'll typically have one of those two be bot. The other one may be bot also, or it may be uh, a reference or a lambda. This is nice because it lets you not have to worry about weirdnesses in typing, right? The first thing is always a bot or a ref. Second thing is always a bottom or a lambda. And you know, note the recursion. So this can get arbitrarily uh, complicated. So points to analysis is concerned with figuring out the type of thing pointed to by each variable, which is a pointer, and then ultimately our goal is going to be to build that 
uh, tree you see over on the far right hand side that shows how things interrelate. So you'll see there's a variable, that's that thing in bold at the start. So we have, in this case, seven of them, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and P. Those are the variables. Each variable has an associated type and we'll call those tau1, tau2, etc. And that's the type of that variable. And then we can express that type potentially as a reference to something else. So tau1 is a reference to something of type tau4, for example. There could be function pointer types. We're not using them in this little example, but they do show up elsewhere in the Steens Guard paper. The algorithm works by assuming every variable has a unique type. Every variable is its own special snowflake having its own type unrelated to all the others. But as we walk through the program, we'll discover that maybe there has to be a relationship, right? We'll find out that A is being assigned to an instance of B. So clearly A's type and B's type have to be related somehow. B at least has to be assignable to A. And so from that, we will then maybe merge two types together. And it's that merging <coughs> that yields what we see over on the right hand side, right? We start out with every bubble all on its own. And then we discover that we have to merge some of them together, like X and Z there at the bottom. He gives you typing rules. The typing rules look like this little schema, right? Stuff on the top. If that stuff, a little database, all, all those things hold, if they're all true, then the thing on the bottom also holds. I'm able to conclude that. Uh, so I have premises and then a conclusion. And you see at the bottom, a program statement. So here, if the things on the top are true, I am able to conclude that x equal y is well typed. So what's a in this? A is my typing rule. A is the set of rules I use to assign types to things. And what this is telling me is, if my typing rule entails that x is a reference to an alpha one, and that y is a reference to some alpha two, and I can conclude that alpha two can be contained in alpha one, which makes sense, right? Because I'm gonna assign y to x. Then I'm able to uh, say that the typing rule gives me the correct typing for x gets y. All right. So here's the same thing, just in more words. So points to typing in the storage shape graph. So here's a little example program from Steensguard's paper, along with his typing of it and his uh, graph, okay? Here's his example program, uh, and then a graphical representation. So he says, the types T1 and T5 are structurally equivalent. So let's take a look at that. T1 and T5. So T1 is the type for A, T5 is the type for Y, and you can see where they appear over in that uh, hierarchy. A is up at the top, Y is sort of down there in the middle. And you can see where they come up in the lines of code we see over in the program. And you can see where they're probably related, right? Y can be a reference to Z, or Y can be a reference to X. And, and this is where this stuff sort of pops out. Why is A implicated? Remember, A is a reference to X. And I'm saying also that y is a reference to x. All right. So are they structurally equivalent? Yeah, they both are references to something of type tau sub 4. Is that all they are? Maybe not, right? Tau 1 doesn't have to be the same as tau 5, right? We just know that they contain references. They both contain a reference to something that's of type tau 4. And you can see that because they both point to X and Z. Same thing for tau two and tau three, right? They're both references to something of type tau five. And you can see that B and C both point to Y. <clears throat> we don't know enough 
to know that B and C are the same or that A and Y are the same. And when we know that, you know, think about that for a minute. If we concluded that A and Y are the same, we would conclude that B was allowed to point to A, but we just don't know that from this program. And so we, we can't reach that conclusion. Tau 4 and Tau 6, right? Another pair that looks structurally the same. In this case, they are both bottom. And we don't know anything about them, right? There's no pointers in there, so we just have two separate unconnected blocks for that. Even though they're structured the same, they're not considered the same type. So, can we apply all the stuff that we've been talking about with Steen's Guard to assembly? And where would we apply it? Do, do we apply it to the registers as variables, to locations in memory, to both, to neither? What is it? Well, in Steen's Guard's discussion, a variable has an associated fixed type. But in assembly, a register could one minute be holding a memory location, the next it could be holding an offset or an index into something, the next it could be a simple integer, the next it might be a floating point value, so on. So we just don't know. Let's talk about the algorithm. So here's this sketch of the algorithm. Basic principle is that we start with the assumption that all variables are described by different types. So phase one of the algorithm is give every variable a type. Give them all a different type. Every variable has its own type initially. What do we do then? Well, we merge types as we are required to to assure the well-typedness of different parts of the program. And merging two types means replacing the two type variables with a single type variable throughout the typing environment. So we're going to do that using a disjoint set data structure. You probably covered that in your data structures class, but just in case. It's a data structure that keeps track of a partition of a set of elements, in this case type variables. Blocks of the partition can be quickly combined, that's the union, and it's very fast to check whether elements are in the same set. That's the find. So just in case, I'm going to go over some, some names here. A set can be partitioned. The result of that is a set of sets, a set of subsets of the original set, and that is the partition. Each individual set in a partition is not a partition. It is a block of the partition. You can also get a partition using an equivalence relation, right? So a set uh, can be broken up by an equivalence relation. In that case, a block is an equivalence class. Okay, so don't get confused by saying the word partition for both the partition and for the individual blocks. That, that's bad. So, initially each variable is in its own equivalence class, or each block of a partition. It's in its own set all to itself. If two variables are the same, I now have to merge the equivalence classes via a union of their sets. So, what's going on here? So using both path compression, splitting, or halving, and union by rank and size, assures that the amortized time per operation is only that. This is from the disjoint set data structure. So you don't have to worry about all the other stuff at the top there. What, you, what I want to point out here is the time per operation for a disjoint set data structure is on the order of alpha of n. Now what is alpha of n? That is the inverse Ackerman function. Okay. This is a function that is not a constant. It grows, but it grows unbelievably slowly. It gro grows so slowly that the value doesn't even reach 5 for any value of n that can be written in the physical universe. So that's big, right? That's big. How much space do I have for digits? Well, how many atoms do you have in the universe? 
I can't write this number down with that few digits. <clears throat> so basically, the disjoint set operations take place in constant time for all practical purposes, but, but not really. That's, an, that's another almost constant time, which leads to another you know, almost linear claim. Really, really close. The inverse Ackermann function is fascinating. If you haven't read about it, you might want to. It shows up in complexity classes. Uh, it's interesting because it's not, it's one of the first computable functions. It's not primitive recursive. You can look that up. That's the PR complexity class. Stuff that you should, should learn about because it's interesting computing theory, but otherwise not relevant. So, we're going to apply this two-phase method to a simple program at right, and we're going to need that typing rule, which says that if A entails that X is a reference of type tau, and the underscore means I don't care, and A entails that Y is of type tau, then it's okay for me to say X gets a, the address of Y, or X becomes a pointer to Y. That should make sense, right? X is a reference to something of type tau, and Y is of type tau, so it's okay for, for X to be a reference to Y. Okay? So we're going to need that typing rule. So, phase one. We initialize everything to its own type. A is type tau 1, B is type tau 2, etc. And all types are initially bottom cross bottom. Okay? Maybe they're not references at all. Maybe A is an integer. So it's not a reference, right? And so we'd write that as ref bottom cross bottom. Now we go into phase two. In phase two, we process each statement exactly once. That's why it's linear in the size of the program, or almost linear in the size of the program. We'll add some complexity as we go. So we'll use the type rules to figure out if two type variables must be joined. We won't consider function pointers here, okay? Uh, and if I give you something like this on the exam, no function pointers there either. If the left-hand side is bottom, then there's no need to join. If the left-hand side type is not bottom, then the two types must be joined. We'll see why that happens in just a moment. So, sorry about the slightly off kilter uh, text here. Uh, just pretend those tau's are inside the parentheses. So we start with the first line. And we have that A gets a reference to X. I'm thinking C++ where at is reference, but you can think C where it's get the address of X. So uh, A is getting the address of X, or A is getting a reference to X. Either one's fine. So A will hold a reference to X. So we know something about the type of A we know that it must be a reference to something of the type of x. Well, what is the type of x? The type of x is tau 4, right? We see it over here on the side, right? There's tau 4. So we're going to use the type rule we have, the only type rule we're going to need for this one. And since we know that uh, we want this to be well typed, we have to also have that uh, the, you know, the references work this way. Based on that, we need to rewrite A. We need to rewrite it to be a reference to type tau4 because we know that A can hold a reference to, in this case, X, which has type tau4. Okay, so this is a little chain here. We have these two types, A and X, and we're going to rewrite A to now hold a reference to something of type tau4, which is the type of X. Now we need to go over here and put it in, in this slot. And there it is. A is now a reference to something of type tau4. Great. That took care of that line. I want to point out that in this case, everything was bottom here. If that is the case, then it's easy. You just make uh, the one on the left here, this guy, a reference to the correct type. Let's go to the next one. So for the next one, we have that B is going to hold a reference to Y. 
y has type tau 5 and initially b is a reference to bottom cross bottom we're going to change that and now it's going to be a reference to something of type tau 5 with the same typing rule so we update that and we're good we go to the next line here we say z is going to be oh sorry y is going to be referenced to, to uh, z z is type tau 6 there's y we're going to replace the first element of the reference in y with tau 6 and go on and then we hit the next line and now we have the first different case the first case where the thing on the left y its type does not have bottom in that uh, in that first slot so here we want to say y can hold a reference to x so that would mean we would put tau 4 in this first slot but tau 6 is already in that slot so what this tells us is we have to merge the two type variables tau 4 and tau 6 they have to be merged together what does that mean that means everywhere where there's a tau I gotta pick one let's pick one I'm gonna pick tau 4 everywhere there's a tau 6 I'll replace it with tau 4 okay and, and and that's what we'll do we'll just replace one with the other throughout we'll come back to, to more detail on this in a moment that'll look like what you see there and that'll result in the change we see here right y is now a reference to something of type tau 4 and z is now of type tau 4 instead of tau 6 so we have that uh, c holds a reference to y so the type of c has to be referenced to the type of y and again we look at that and we see that c has bottom in both slots so we can go ahead and put put tau 5 in there there we go and we're done we now have the complete uh, set of types for that phase 2 is complete now from this we can draw the graph and so uh, here I've drawn it with types so we know that tau 1 could be referenced to tau 4 and tau 5 can be referenced to tau 4 and tau 2 and tau 3 can both be references to tau 5 and tau 7 is is unrelated to this I could also put the variable names in here and so then we would have a sense of which variables are allowed to refer to other variables and that's what we were ultimately trying to get out of the points to analysis does it make sense given the previous program well, let's let's have a look uh, a can be referenced to X that's shown here B can be referenced to Y that's shown up here uh, if P is true P is just over here to the side not necessarily a pointer then Y can get a reference to Z and Y can get a reference to X so I gotta really merge those two so that Y can be referenced to either one and then C can be a reference to Y so we concluded that X and Z had to be the same type and there was nothing in the original program that would directly tell us that we inferred that from the way it was being used so let's talk about conditional join so in the Steensburg paper he defines this partial order so you'll remember this partial order it consists of two pieces one we define that t1 is and again I'll call this less than or equal to t1 is less than or equal to t2 if and only if either t1 is the bottom of the type hierarchy or t1 is equal to t2 and we can think of that however makes sense to you we can think of that as t1 fits in t2 or t1 is assignable to t2 it's it's up to you how you want to perceive that in addition we can expand that to ordered pairs and once we've done that we've really opened it up to everything because each of those types could themselves be an ordered pair and so then we have triples and we have you know, ordered uh, uh, four tuples etc and the idea is that the cross product of t1 and t2 is less than equal to the cross product of t3 and t4 if and only if you know, each of the corresponding ones have the same relation so t1 is less than or equal to t3 and t2 is less than or equal to t4 so consider 
just for a moment, what this means if we can conclude that the left-hand side is true from our typing rule. So we can conclude that T1 is less than or equal to T2. From that, we can conclude the what's on the right. Either T1 is bottom or T1 is equal to T2. So if we know, for instance, that T1 is not the bottom of the type hierarchy, we are left with the only possibility, which is that T1 must be the same as T2, and we should merge them. So that's where the merge came from in the last uh, example we worked through. So if the left-hand side is bottom, we don't need to merge. But if the left-hand side is not bottom, then we do. We call this a conditional join, and in the paper, he represents it by C join. And this is different from always join represented by join. And we'll see that in just a few moments. It is possible, okay, that we later change the type of a variable through a join. And it's no longer bottom. So think about this. We go through the list of statements. Along the way, I see that the left-hand side is bottom, and so I replace it with another type, and I plow on ahead. Or maybe I don't replace it, I plow on ahead. But then later on, I discover that, oh, it needs to be merged, or something else needs to happen. Then I might have to go back and reevaluate previous work that I did, because I might need to merge more things. I might need to merge two, or three, or four things together. Well, that's a problem. I don't want to backtrack because that will ruin my time complexity. So what am I going to do? Well, instead what I do is, for every bottom, I keep a list of type variables to join if we should ever change that bottom to something else. And we call that the pending set. And if we do change it to something else, then suddenly we have to merge all those type variables. This will make sense, more sense in just a moment. Let's talk about the rules. So here's an example of the conditional join rule straight out of Steensburg's paper. So I'm going to conditional join two expressions, E1 and E2. And so I ask, is the type of E1 bottom? And if it is, I do a couple of things here. I take the pending set for E2 and I take E1 I union it with the pending set for E2, and I make that the pending set for E2. All right, it's pretty complicated. Let's, let's go through it very carefully. I'm conditionally joining E1 and E2. E2 is bottom, so therefore it might have a pending set. E1 uh, needs to be added to that pending set, and that's what it does. It adds E1 to the pending set. Otherwise, it's not bottom, and now I actually have to do that join of the two variables. What is a join? Well, there's join, again, from Steensburg's paper. And that looks like it's a lot going on. It's super complicated. It, it's really not. Uh, I'm joining two, type, or two expressions, E1 and E2 expressions. Excuse me. T1 is the type of the first expression. T2 is the type of the second expression. And E is the ECR union of E1 and E2. What is, what is that? Well, ECR is the equivalence class representative. Okay, so remember how we define the partition? Each block of that partition is distinct from the others. We can pick one element of that block and that becomes the equivalence class representative, right? So, so uh, we need a representative for all even numbers. Two. Two will be a representative for all even numbers. We need a representative for all e odd numbers. One. One is a representative for all odd numbers. Okay, same kind of thing here. We pick a representative, okay? And here we're picking a representative of the union of the classes for E1 and E2. Now, if type 1 is bottom, okay, then we know the type of E, the type for that union of the two, is T2. Again, we're joining 
T we're doing E1 and E2. So the type of E, which is the union, is now going to be T2. Well, what if T2 is bottom? Then we update the pending set by unioning the two pending sets. And then for every X in the pending set, uh, we do the joint if it's not the bottom, right? It's not bottom, then we actually have to do the, the recursive join for everything else. And this is where the complexity becomes nonlinear a little bit. Otherwise, T1 is not bottom, okay? So now T1 is the type of E. If T2 is bottom, we again have to do this thing where we uh, look at the pending set and we do the join, okay? Otherwise, we get to the end there, so type T1 was not bottom, type T2 was not bottom, T1 and T2 are real types, I now have to unify those two types. The other two cases are fairly easy, right? The first one is bottom. Okay, I said, I did, do I just what I did in the example, right? I put the, the T2 in that type, I then do any pending stuff I have to do, right? If the type of, of E is T1 and T2 is bottom, then I have to again do the pending stuff, etc. But if they're both types, I have to unify. How do I unify? So I'm given two types, I'm unifying types. Types look like these references. And so I have a, T, a tau 1 and a tau 2, a lambda 1 and a lambda 2. And what I do is I do joins on those. If they're not already equal, then I join them, okay? And so I recursively call that join over there, which replaces one type with the other. Whew, it's a lot, it's pretty, pretty uh, complicated stuff. Let me go back for a moment. But if you take the expressions and you plug them in, you plug E1 and E2 in there and do substitution, you substitute for E, and you figure out T1 and T2 and you substitute those through, it just sort of falls out. All right. The paper builds rules like that for all of the statements. Uh, the one used in the prior example was that one right there. If X is a reference to Y, then we let that reference be a type for the equivalence class representative of X, right? So, so X We'll have some equivalence class. We pick a representative from that equivalence class, representative expression, and we get the type of that expression, and we say, hey, that's ref of tau one, and I don't care. Okay, and then we let tau two be the equivalence class representative of y. We let these two things hold in this expression down here. If they're not already the same, then we have to join the types. Let's think this through a little carefully here. X looks like this. And Y has this type. And so if this were a lambda, I would just put T2 in there. But I can't just do that, right? So because the types here, I have types for both, and they're different, I have to join those two. That's where we, <coughs> where we combine the two types and they're placed one with the other. So here's a more concrete example. Let's make, see if this helps. I have Y gets a reference to X and I have types for X and Y. I want to substitute into the rule which is confusingly looks like this. And so I'm going to match the concrete Y against the abstract X and the concrete X to the abstract Y and then I do substitution in this expression down here. So we expect that to become a Y and that to become an X. And in fact, that's what happens over here. And I'm left with this expression, which is the substituted expression that actually matches a specific condition. Okay, so now I have this and I just need now to evaluate that. So I need an equivalence class representative for X and Y. And so for those, tau 4, tau 5. Easy. So now when I have ECRY down here, 
I can substitute tau 5. When I have ECRX, I can substitute tau 4. Okay? I can plug those in down here. That gives me this, right? ECRY was this, so I plug that in here. ECRX is this, so I plug T4 in here. So now I have tau 1 equal to tau 6, I don't care here. And I have, uh, if tau 2 is not tau 4 in this expression, okay? So, let me go back, be sure this is clear. I let this reference be this, so here I've got tau 1 and here I have tau 6, which is the concrete type, this is the abstract type. So when I have tau 1 down here, that'll be tau 6, that'll be tau 6, and tau 2 is tau 4, again this is a concrete type, so this will be tau 4, and that will be tau 4. And so I make those substitutions and that results in some simplification. And so once I make these substitutions, I don't need this let part in, I just have this. If tau 6 is not equal to tau 4, then join tau 6 and tau 4. And that's what I need to do in this case. All right, other rules are similar. You just sort of plug in, you substitute, and you turn the crank, uh, and there you go. And so here we have a conditional join. And again, this is where the inequality, this is where the nonlinear comes in because we have this recursion happening. The most complex rules are for functions. This rule is for function invocation. You won't need this for, the, for anything I'll assign you. But while it looks impressive and scary, it's really not. You would plug in the function here. You plug in the, you know, the, the different arguments, the different returns in this body, and you'd work through it the same way we just did. So, that's the Steensgard algorithm. You uh, write down the program, you go through it line by line, you get the uh, constraint associated with each of these, you apply the rules that he has, you apply the rules he's got, and you generate these uh, type constraints. How has it held up? It's held up really well. There's a paper from 2003, which pointer analysis should I use, by Hind and Pioli, and you know their conclusion was Steen's guard analysis is significantly more precise than the address taken analysis, without an appreciable increase in compilation time or memory usage, and therefore should always be preferred over the address taken analysis. Again, these are all going to be approximations. And Steen's guard is going to fail to join types in some cases, which another algorithm that uses more information might actually be able to join. But that algorithm is going to have a higher time complexity, it's going to require more space to compute, it's going to be tougher. Steen's guard is in this sweet spot uh, of these trade offs. All right. There are many implementations of Steen's Guard analysis. There's LLVM. There, it's in it's in a lot of different places. You're not going to have to implement Steen's Guard's algorithm. The point of going through it is for you to see a lot of the details of how this formal analysis of programs works, how type analysis is helpful, and how you can get a handle on fairly complicated topics in a way that doesn't consume every cycle on the machine. Steen's guard's analysis is efficient because it's whole programs, and you know what that's about, and you know what interprocedural is, it's whole program, and you can see how all this this operates. Here it is in Go, right? The repository contains a Go adaptation of Steen's guard's pointer analysis algorithm, right? They're out there in the world. All right, so this homework, due next, due on the 16th. 
and the homework is going to be to do program slicing. So I'm going to give you an ELF file. It's not going to contain complex control flow. It's going to be straight line code ending with a return. So I'll give you an ELF file and an address. So for example, uh, the example on the right, I give you 401002 and I give you a pointer to code that contains this. Your job is to go and first extract the basic block at that address. So you'll go to that address. You'll have to slice the data to get there and set the address correctly and then extract the basic block ending in a return. So you can just literally watch for the return and you'll know that you're done. And that's fine. Once you have that, I want you to assume that RAX is live at the end. Okay? And then you're going to work your way back and slice the code based on that. So we're going to construct the backward slice of the block based on the value of RAX immediately prior to the return. So RAX is our care set here. <clears throat> I go back one. What does leave modify? Does it modify anything in the care set? Does leave modify RAX? It doesn't. It only modifies RSP and RBP. So I can throw the leave away. I go back. Does and EDX EDX modify anything in the care set? Does it modify RAX? It doesn't. So I can throw it away. I go back another line. Does move RAX RSI modify anything in the care set? It does. It modifies RAX. Okay, great. I keep this line. I throw away EDX. That's okay. It wasn't in the set anyway. I'm oh, sorry. I throw away RAX. Pardon me. I throw away RAX. <clears throat> now my set's empty. That's okay. I'm going to add the R values, and that's RSI. So now my care set is just RSI. Now I move back to this add. RSI is an L value, so I throw it away. I keep the line. And RSI is also an R value, so now it gets added back. So throw away first, and then add back second. And I wind up with the set RSI, and I just work back that same way. If I get to the end and the set is not empty, I want you to tell me what that is. So you'll work backward, but then you'll print the stuff forward. This is the slice of this code up here on RAX at the end. And you'll see if I want to know RAX at the beginning, I need to know RDI at the start and these instructions. And that's it. Here's an example of my code working through it with debug turned on. So you can see all the little pieces are, are moving around. Since there's no control flow in this, no specialized control flow other than sequence, you don't need fee functions. You won't be, merge, won't be merging stuff. You might think, how would I do this if I had fee functions? Give that a little bit of thought. Some hints, don't worry about skipping the return. You can convince yourself that's not important. Sets are very useful for this, Python sets. Again, if you're gonna store a set somewhere, you wanna actually copy that set. So do, if you have a set X, do x.copy when you store it. <clears throat> and that's it.